Okay, so today I'm going to go over a few different things, a few kind of random things that we went over in class and lecture um, last week, at, earlier this week. So um, if you weren't able to catch the lecture or if you were there and you're just forgetting a couple things, um, hopefully I'll be able to remember, remember all of the questions that you guys asked and get the answers to that within this. Um, so first thing that a few people have been having problems with um, is placing walls in a curtain wall or a storefront system. So under the walls tool, if you pull this down you go all the way down to the bottom, there's this storefront wall type. If I click and I drag that, and then I'm going to go to the 3D view. Um, same thing with any other wall. If I select the entire wall system, I can constrain it to my level 2, um, which jumps it down a little bit. Um, so the way these, this system works is it's, it's a series of different components all kind of grouped together. So if I click on the entirety of the wall and hit edit type here, I can pull up and change the spacing. So if I make this say 7 foot instead of 5 foot, and I make this say 6 foot instead of 8, and hit apply, it changes the grid spacing. Um, now, because my wall length is 16 feet and my spacing is 7 foot, it's going to start at one end and go 7 foot, 7 foot, and then whatever's left over is going to be left there. Um, so it doesn't necessarily space them perfectly uh, equal if you have it set to fixed distance. But if you have it set to maximum spacing, it will automatically constrain them to equal proportions. So because this is set to maximum spacing, I tell it I want a maximum panel size of 7 foot, and then it says, okay, without going over 7 foot, what are these need to be to be equal? Um, you can also drop this down, and you could do fixed distance, you could do a fixed number, or you could do a minimum spacing. Um, if you go to fixed number, let's change both of these to fixed number, and hit OK, over here, on this little drop down, over here is your your numbers. So you can click this and crank this up to two, three, make, and you can adjust the amount that you've got there. Um, but the biggest issue that people have been having is placing doors um, in these families here. So the way to go about doing that is you can't place doors the same way you would in other wall types. So um, for instance, if I create another wall here off to the side, and then I bring up my doors tool, I can place a door here. That's not a problem. But on this type, I can't. And the reason for that is because of how the grid system works and how that's all constrained together. So to put a door within this system, I'm going to zoom in here. And right where the glass is meeting the, uh, the mullions, I'm going to hit Tab. And it allows me to select just the glass pane. So this is kind of handy if you want to create a big, huge wall system that has a whole bunch of different panes of glass, and you want to create something kind of crazy and do you know, one color of gl glass on this one and a different color here, and maybe this one's not glass, it's solid, or it has a different texture to it, all that um, kind of stuff. Is this is how you would go about doing it. So right now, I can't pull this down at all. It's grayed out. And the reason for that is it's pinned. So if I click that, it unpins it. And now I, I've got this little pull down here. And what I can do is I can go to Edit Type. And I could change the material of this if I wanted. Um, or I could just come up here and pull this down and say, OK, I don't want it to be glass. I want it to be a solid. Um, but I'm going to leave it as glass for now, and I'm going to go up here and hit load. And then I'm going to go to doors. And there are three types of doors in here that you can use here. There's the double glass that has no frame around it. There's single without a frame. And then there's the double with a frame around it. So if I just hit open and load one of those in, now this entire thing changes from a glazed panel to a curtain wall storefront double. If I hit OK, now it makes that panel the double doors. Now, 
the weird part about this is now there's this kind of mullion at the bottom. If you don't want that mullion, you don't want that sort of threshold stepping up into uh, the space. If you unpin that, I can hit delete and delete that and it'll drop it down. So that's one way to go about doing it. You can also, you know, if you, say you wanted this kind of division on the sides and not in the middle, you could go with that. Um, you can also come up here. These are your tools for manipulating um, curtain curtain walls. So if I go to curtain grid um, and I hover over this, I could place another mullion all the way across. I could click one segment up here and do just one little section. Um, so that's how you can manipulate that type of thing. I've seen a few people's uh, curtain curtain walls and storefront systems. All they have are these little lines. They don't have the big uh, the thickness that has the mullions to it. To add that, all you do is click this mullion tool, and then you'll click on the the grid lines all the way around. Okay, so that's basically how you add doors and stuff to these types of walls. Um, getting into uh, ceilings and roofs. So if I create, let's say I'm going to create a system here. I'm going to create a little bit of a, just a perimeter here that you can look at. Um, okay, so let's say this is my space. If I come up here to architecture and I hit ceiling, I have two options here. I have automatic ceiling, which I can place in on, you can see that red line that hovers over it. It basically recognizes the space, and I can click, and if I go to 3D view, let's adjust all of this, and straighten these to level two. Now you can see this ceiling sitting in there. So the automatic ceiling tool is, is pretty nice when it comes to that type of stuff. But the only problem with it is a lot of times you have your walls going up to your what you want your ceiling level to be at. So if I click ceiling and say I want my my walls are going up to 10 foot right now. If I want my ceiling height at 10 foot and I punch in down here in the corner uh, height offset from the level that I'm on to be 10 foot. Now it doesn't give me that little highlighted box and it's telling me I can't place it there. Um, and the reason for that is my walls only go up to 10 foot. It wants the walls to go up beyond what my ceiling is at so that it bounds the sides of my ceiling and my ceiling's not floating above my walls. Um, a nice way to use the automatic ceiling tool and get around this is to just make this, we'll say let's make this 9 foot and then I go into my 3D view I pick my ceiling and then I can change this to 10. That's a quick way to go ahead and just throw a ceiling in and then just move it to where you want it to go. Um, if you don't want to do it that way, if you have various other things, like if I wanted to cut a section out of this ceiling right here in the middle, I could click ceiling and then go to sketch ceiling. And if I use this pick walls tool, I can go around and click all of these in here, and then use another sketch tool to throw in an, basically a hole in my, um, in my ceiling. And with the sketch tool, it doesn't matter where your walls go up to. I can make this 10 foot and it's not going to have a problem. So that's basically ceilings. So ceilings here, um, you can adjust just like with walls. Um, that I've gone over in past tutorials. It's got a structure and it's got layers and stuff. Um, same thing here. You can apply different thicknesses and build up a, a structure to your ceiling. Um, so that's one thing that uh, you may want to do. You can add a thickness to this so that it's not fairly thin. You give yourself some structure and that sort of thing. Um, I prefer to build all of my floors. So if I'm Let's go to an elevation view here. So let's say I've got a first floor here, and then I've got a second floor on top here. 
I will put a floor in, so rather than a ceiling, a floor, which floors work almost the exact same way as um, ceilings, only instead of height offset from level, it just keeps it right at zero foot zero. You can adjust that if you want to, um, but they essentially work almost the exact same way, only instead of, um, and also instead of having the automatic tool, you have to sketch a floor line out. Um, but at any rate, level one, I'll put a floor in because it's the very bottom floor. I don't have any spaces underneath here. Um, but then when I go up to this floor, if instead of putting a floor system in, I'll put a ceiling in. The reason for that is I have spaces down below here that I may want to render at some point. And if this is a floor system up above it, floor systems you cannot place lights into. Um, so if I wanted to render a space down here and I wanted to put a bunch of can lights in the, in the ceiling um, and I have a floor system sitting there, I would have, I'd put my ceiling in just below the floor system and then if I put my can lights and stuff in that ceiling, it would eat up into my floor system and that floor system can't be cut by the lights. So what I would end up with is a giant solid mass going straight over, straight into my can light and then I would get no light out of my can light because it's inside the floor. Um, and that can light's not cutting a space out of the floor to allow the light to come down into the space below. So what I tend to do is I will make my floors for all of these levels above my first floor ceilings and then I'll just create whatever thickness my floor system would have I'd make that out of ceilings. Um, they'll read pretty much the same way um, as a floor and everything. The added bo bonus is just that you can basically place lights into it. Um, if I place, let's go up to component here, and I'm going to load in a can light. So if I place this can light here, you can see how it, it pops up into uh, into my ceiling. If I were to make this ceiling thicker, so let's say let's say I make it a foot thick, and say okay. Now you see this is thicker than the can light, than the can light is tall, but it still cuts that all the way out through the entire thing. If for whatever reason um, on the second floor, you're going to see all of these little holes where you place lights in the first floor. What I'll tend to do is I'll leave out my finish on my uh, second floor. So if I've got you know, my drywall, my structure, all of that stuff built into my ceiling, and then I'll have my subfloor built into my ceiling, but then whatever my floor finish is on my second floor, I will make that out of a floor system. And that floor will cover all of these holes that are punched out here. But it won't be so thick that it gets into the can light itself. Um, so then I won't have any problems rendering anything down below um, and I still get the the bonus of not having these these little um, circles show up in my second floor plan or anything like that. So that's basically ceilings. Um, so I'm going to delete that. Now we'll get into roofs. So if I go to my level one plan here, there are two different, well there's three different roof types. Roof by face is used for when you have kind of really unique conditions, so like that picture there shows, um, you've got kind of a warped, kind of odd configuration. Um, roof by extrusion is works the same way the extrusion tool works in the family editor. Uh, you draw a little sketch and then it extrudes that sketch all along. Um, along essentially a distance. But roof by footprint is what you'll use probably most often. Um, so if I hit roof by footprint, it's going to say, okay, you're creating your roof on your lowest level. Do you want to move it to the level above what you're looking at? And I'll say yes, because I don't want my roof starting on level one. I want it to start on level two. Um, so it defaults and gives me this, uh, this pick walls tool here. And over here, I can set an overhang. So if, let's say I want a two foot overhang going all the way around here. So 
as I select my walls, you'll see it kind of jumps out two feet and provides me with my two foot overhang without me having to move anything. So I create my sketch of where the limits of my roof are going to be. And right now you see all these carrots and little triangles that are associated with each line. What that means is that each line is defining some sort of slope here. So each line, it's going to slope away from each one of those lines. So this line, it's going to slope up this way, this one up this way, this one this way, this one this way. So what I've essentially created is a giant hip roof all the way um, around my entire building. So if I hit my check mark and go to my 3D view, you'll see, and just for viewing purposes, um, here's basically what you end up with. You end up with a whole bunch of hips and everything all around here. And it resolves, you know, how all these ridges and stuff end up intersecting. So if I click on this, I have the option of I can drag things up and down. So I can pull this down if I want to. I can pull this down if I want to. Um, but that's not a very accurate way of arranging this. A better way of doing this is over here is your slope. So this is for the entire roof. If that's too steep of a slope, I can make this say a 412 and it'll automatically drop everything down. Um, but maybe I don't like this little this little uh, kind of ridge meeting here um, that creates kind of a weird awkward condition there. So essentially to fix that, what I want is a s less steep of a slope coming up from either side here and keep this slope the same. So what I'll do is I'll go back into my footprint here. And if I click on one of these, and let's go back to plan so we can see this a little better. If I click on this line, it pops up the little slope option here. So I could change this to a 412, and I'll change this to a 412. If I didn't change this one and I changed that one, my ridge would end up being off center. Because this one's moving up at a 412, this one's at a 912, and it would just end up with uh, a ridge way over here. So if I hit my check mark and go back, now it's brought that down, um, brought the ridge down. But now I'm getting this kind of awkward condition here in the corner. Um, it's and the reason for that is because I my overhang isn't far enough to get get me down to where I want to be, um, and that can be resolved by doing your roofs in in various pieces. Um, so maybe I create this roof separate from this one, and then there's an option of modify. Um, here is join, unjoin roof. So I can click on this, and if you watch this little animation, you can click on the side of a roof and then click the face of another, and it'll join it together. That's a pretty good example of exactly the condition we have here. Um, and that's how you would kind of go about resolving those issues. And any time you have eave heights that are going to be different, you're going to want to make those as separate roofs rather than one giant sketch. Um, so another aspect of this is creating gabled ends rather than hips. So if I go to my edit footprint and I come back into my plan view here, if I were to select this line here, also up here is the option of define slope. So if I don't want a hip here, I don't want this to slope away from this line, I can hit define slope there and I'll also turn off define slope on these two to show you another issue that you may run into. And I hit this check mark. I go to my 3D view. So now it's created a gable on the end here and similarly uh, it's created a gable on the end here. Um, it's having a few issues obviously. <laughs> um, so if I were to pull this down a little bit, that'll help. So, okay, so I get this kind of gabled end here and I get a, a sort of gabled end there. The issue that you'll run into is if you have a gable intersecting another gable is this roof here does not extend back under this one to that, to that roof line or to that wall line rather. So you'll have to piece this together and a way to go about doing that is I created this one and I'm going to use this as my essentially as my template uh, for the other one. 
So I'll go roof by footprint, and I'm going to pick lines. And I'm going to just go around this one. And then I'm going to select this wall rather than this back edge, because I want my, my roof to come back to this point. And then I want gable, so I'm going to turn the define slope off on that side, but I'm also going to turn it off on this side, because I don't want this to define a slope and come up and create a weird condition there. So, and then I'm going to change this to a 412 and hit my check mark. Okay, so now I've got my, my individual roof and it comes all the way back to this point. Now I need to create this roof. So if I go to roof by footprint, select lines, I'm going to select all the way around here. Trim those off, and I'll turn this into defined slope, and I'll move this down to say a 612. And now I'll hit my check mark there. So now if I delete my first roof that's causing me problems, now I essentially have the exact same thing as I had before. This was pulled down maybe a little bit further, but it's essentially the same thing. And now this roof extends back underneath here. So that way I can get that roof to intersect with these walls. Um, now when you have a gabled end like this, you're going to want your wall to obviously come up and meet your roof. If I click on my wall and hit attach top to base, I can click that roof and it will automatically fill that in for me. Um, same thing with all of these. Whoop, not that one. If I click attach top to base and select this, it'll jump that up. Um, so the issue, and then I don't want that one to go up there, I'll stop that one. Um, now you can see that these don't fill in here because they're just running along the side here. If you want to fill this in, you can either create another wall, offset it all the way up here, or you can take this wall and hit edit profile. It's going to say, okay, it's attached to a roof here, we're going to remove that attachment to show you what essentially the original profile is. You say, okay, close, that's fine. And if I go to an elevation view, I can see what I'm working with a little bit better here. Um, I can delete that line, and I'm going to say, okay, I want to draw something new here. And I'm going to sketch out where, I'm going to go on the bottom side here, and I can sketch out basic outline of where I want this um, this wall to go. So if I sketch all these out and I get this outline, I can hit the check mark and it says it can't keep those joined because I removed the, the top line here and that top line was jumping up and attaching, but I don't longer care whether it's completely joined to that or not because I've got a line running right underneath it. So you hit unjoin and now if I go to my 3D view, that is that wall is coming all the way up and meeting that, that roof there. Um, so another aspect, you're going to have this little line here. Sometimes you can join one wall to the other, and it'll remove that line if they're the same wall type. If not, you'll probably still have a line there. But you can also come in and under this line work here, I can come in and say invisible lines in any line within a certain view you could click on and make that line go away. You're still going to see the shadow wrapping here but if I were to go to my hidden line view now that line's gone away. I can go around and click various lines and essentially make my entire model disappear in hidden line view if I wanted to um, just by changing the lines. Everything is still there so I could always come back in and say by category and find those lines again and bring them back. Um, but so that's essentially how the footprint tool works for roofs. Um, and I'm going to reset that profile. So now, uh, roof by extrusion. If I go to say my south elevation here, roof by extrusion. I'm going to say, it's going to ask me, what work plane do you want to work on? I'm going to say, pick a plane and select the wall that's closest here. I'll say, okay. And now, 
what it's telling me is I'm going to draw a 12 inch thick just generic roof. So the nice part about this is I can create kind of weird shapes. So let's say I'm going to just use this spline tool for instance and let's say I wanted a roof that was starting at the ground came up a little bit and then it started to bend and maybe I get sort of a weird shape like that. Okay, so because this is defining the thickness, this is telling me that it's going to be 12 inches thick. I don't need to create a closed shape here. All I need is a path, essentially, for it to create this uh, this 12 inch thick extrusion all along. So I've created my little path. If I hit my check mark, now it provides the thickness. And it's going to provide the thickness below the line, as you saw. So if I go to the 3D view, it finds, I was working on this plane here, it finds what the back wall is and extrudes it back to that point. If I don't want it to go back to that point, I can either, over here, it's at zero foot, which zero foot zero is the front face of this wall. Maybe I want it to extend out two feet, so I get that two foot overhang that we talked about before, and I only want it to go back to this wall. If I know what that distance is, I can punch that in here as a negative, so it's coming backwards off of my work plane. Or I can grab this little arrow here, and it'll snap to that wall, hopefully. Maybe not. Another way to do it is use your align tool right up here. And I'll hit align my that wall to that point, and then it'll align that. So even with uh, shapes like this, I can click my wall and hit attach and attach it to that, and it will conform to the, to the shape. Um, so that's one way to do an extrusion um, roof type. So if that's something that you know, might work for a various, various parts of your project, go for it. If not, the roof by footprint tool is probably your better bet. Um, but otherwise, that's essentially roofs. Um, so from here, I'm going to get rid of all of this. And I'm going to get out of actually the project um, itself. I'm going to leave this open because we will be loading stuff in here um, eventually. But I'm going to open and create a new family and you've got all these options and everything I'm going to just create a furniture family for for starters and within this furniture family I'm going to create I'm going to block out just a I'm not going to worry about dimensions right now um, just to speed things up a little bit so I'm going to create a really rough sort of chair here Okay, and I'll make this. And I'm basically just using extrusions right now. As you can see, I'm just going up and selecting that option. Um, and I'm going to mirror that over the center point. And then I'll make that go up to 3 and hit the check mark. Okay. So now if I go to my 3D view, I've got this sort of really blocky chair. Um, okay, so it's really blocky, and if I render this, it's not going to look great. The question is, how do, I, how do I make this look better? How do I soften some of these edges up? How do I you know, get this looking a little bit better? So let's say I, I'm going to address these arms first. I want to I wanna create some some sort of arm that looks a little bit better than this. So if I go to my front view, I can see I've got my, my seat there, I've got the back, and then I've got my two arms here. I'm going to go to create, and I'm going to create an extrusion first. And I'm going to set my work plane, and I'm going to say pick a plane, I'm going to set my work plane to the front of my, uh, of my arms. And right now, I'm only able to select the edges. I want to be able to select the face of it, which highlights the entire thing. So I'm going to hit tab, and now it gives me the face of it. So I'll click on that, 
and then I'm going to sketch essentially the outline of what I want my arms to be. So I'm going to come up, let's say I come up two foot, I'm going to make a little bit thicker of an arm here, so maybe it's four and a half inches thick, and then I'll come up, and I'm going to use this little tangent arc tool, and I'll grab the edge, and I'm going to swoop that around to there. And then I'll trim this off. And over here, I don't know exactly how far back that went, so I'm just going to hit the check mark and say OK for now. And I'll go into my 3D view, and as you can see, it kind of popped out a little ways here. I'm going to grab this arrow and drag it back until it snaps to that edge here. And actually, I'm going to bring it back so it snaps to the back edge of my the back of my chair. Now, I'm going to get rid of my blocky ones, because I no longer need those. I'm going to be working off of this pretty much entirely. So, now I've got this issue of, okay, it looks nice and rounded this way, and that's looking a little bit better, but this edge is still really a harsh 90 degrees. So, how do I soften that up a little bit? So, if I hit Control-Tab, I'll cycle back through the view. Um that I have open here. So I'll go back to my the last view I had open. And I'm going to go to create and I'm going to create a void here. So I'm going to cut the edges of this thing and round them off. And to do that I'm going to use a void sweep. And if I hit sketch path, I'm going to use pick lines and I'm going to just select all of the little edges here. Now, if you heard that noise or you heard the saw the little box pop up down here, what that was telling me is this is slightly off axis and what they mean by slightly off axis it looks like it's really off axis from horizontal or vertical they also consider a 45 degree angle um, in axis so that is not quite a 45 degree angle but I don't have any views that are at that angle anyway to work on this work plane so I'm gonna click and drag it so that I get it flat and I can work off of that so I'm gonna hit finish and then if I go over here to edit, I'm going to edit the profile. It'll pull up this dialog box that asks me, okay, what, where do you want to work on this? And I'm going to say I'm going to work on this in floor plan. So if I come into my plan view, I'm going to sketch in a shape here. So let's say I come back, say, three quarters of an inch. And then I'm going to come over, say, let's say I come over an inch. So, and then I'll come back, three quarters, and I'm going to draw an arc, and create an arc around this. Now, this is going to cut out this shape all the way around this entire thing. Maybe I don't want to cut out quite this distance, so I'm going to grab this arc tool. I'll hit move, which my hotkey is MV, and I'm going to move this down. Now, if I bring it all the way to the front, it's going to have a problem because this line is intersecting this line. So I'll leave it just shy of that. And I'll hit my check mark, say I'm finished. Uh, lines must be in closed loop. Oh, okay, so it didn't connect to that one end, so if I trim this off there, now it should let me. Now I'll click my green check mark a second time, and it'll cut that. You can already see that it did something to it. So if I hit my 3D view, and let's make this kind of shadow. So you can see how that's rounded that off and it's given it a nice little um, rounded edge but now I have this weird kind of protrusion in the middle there so to get rid of that I'm gonna go back to my to my front view and I'm gonna do another void and I'm gonna void out that one section so I'll use my pick lines again select that all the way around trim those off and now I'm going to set it for just like a half an inch. And I'll hit the green check mark. So you see how it's yellow. When it's yellow, it means it's not cutting anything because it's it's out in front of it. It's not really into anything there. So if I drag this back a little bit, it'll cut back into it and it creates that recess, that, that look that maybe I was going for. Um, so that helps create kind of a rounded edge. Now that arm is looking a little bit better here. Um, it's helping to make that look a little more realistic and uh, not quite so blocky. 
and I could come in and create actual solid extrusions and maybe I create kind of a, a button that runs all the way around the edge here um, I can you know set a different material to that and everything um, but voiding all of this out and then creating voids along the sides here that starts to soften the edges a little bit um, so that's a good way to, of showing you know this is how you would soften it up and create a more realistic piece of furniture as opposed to this harsh blocky sense that I've got going over here so another thing that I was going to show you guys is how to do a what's called a nested family so what that essentially means is I create one family and then I bring it into another family and use it um, basically within this family. So let's say I create I wanted to create a cushion for my um, for my chair here, and I'm going to create a cushion for my chair, and I'm going to I I don't want to work around all of this. So this maybe the, all this stuff is getting in the way of me creating a, a decent cushion here or working efficiently. So I'm going to come up and say new family and I'm going to put it under furniture again and I'm going to create an extrusion and this is going to be essentially the basic building block of my cushion here so I don't care about the the uh, width of it or anything like that because I'm going to make it parametric I'll make it so that I can adjust the width and the depth and all of that stuff of my cushion um, and I'll show how you get into that once I kind of get all of my pieces set here. Um, so if I, cr if I extrude this, I know I'm going to have some really harsh corners on my cushion here. So let's go ahead and round those off. I'm going to use this little fillet tool, and I'll round those off. So if I want the exact same round all over my entire thing, I'm going to just mirror that over a few times. center point there and I'll move this over and then I'll trim these off and so there's the basic building block of my of what my cushion is going to be and I only want my cushion to be let's say four inches thick so I'll apply my little check mark if I go to my 3d view there's my there's my basic cushion right now so, just like with the chair arm, I want to round these edges off. So, if I go to my reference level, I'm going to void sweep. I'm going to sketch a path. I'll select all of these lines running all the way around my cushion. And I don't have a view that's oriented to that, that angle. So, if I click on this and drag it, now I've got something that's perpendicular to that. So, I'll hit finish mode hit edit and it'll tell me do you want to work on the back view looking from this side or working from this side doesn't really matter um, for me right now because either way I'm gonna be looking at pretty much the exact same thing so I'll just go with the back view and I'll click on this and maybe I'll come out three quarters of an inch and then I'm gonna round this up off here and I'll create this little shape that's gonna round over the edge of my cushion I'll click my check mark, click another check mark to finish the sweep, and now it rounds that off. If I go to my plane view, or my elevation view here, I'm going to mirror over top of this so that I get the same thing on the bottom. Now, right now, that's yellow. If I come up here and hit cut, I can select that void and then select the piece that I want it to cut and click on that and it'll cut it. So if anything's ever yellow and you want it to cut something, you can hit this cut tool and select the void and then select the, the piece um, and it'll cut it. You can also pull this pull down and say uncut. So if I didn't want this to cut this, I could click on that and then click the piece and it won't cut it anymore. Um, but since I do, I'll go ahead and make it cut it again. Um, so now I'm getting a little bit better look to it. It's a little bit softer, but still, it, it's kind of lacking some detail here. It's not it's not giving me the the cushiony look that that I really want. Um, it's still kind of basic. So adding tiny little details will really help this. 
So something like, I'm going to go go in here, and because these are rounded off, I'm not going to be able to select the edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Edit Profile, Sketch Path. I'm going to select this path, and I'm going to Control-C and copy it. And then I'll finish this off again. So what I've just done is I've copied that path to use for future stuff. So if I go to Create, and I'm going to create a sweep this time, a solid one, not a void. And I'll go to Sketch Path. If I hit Control-V and paste it in, now where I want to place it, you see the this little drag that shows the dimension? That's how far offset from the base point it is. I want to place it right on top of where it was before. So I'll hit zero foot and hit enter. And it'll place it right where I wanted it before. I'll move my profile here. Hit my check mark. And I can either hit edit profile here or edit profile there. Doesn't really matter which one. I'll go to the back view again. And now I'm looking at the side here. And I'm going to create a little sphere just about, let's say, right in there. And I'll hit my check mark and finish it. And now if I go to my 3D view, I've created kind of a, a seam line all the way around. And that starts to give me a little bit more realism to this thing. So it doesn't look like it's all one giant piece. It looks like it's actually got some seams to it. So I'll take this and I'm going to mirror it over so I get it on the bottom as well. So I get this, this nice uh, kind of seam line. Um, that helps. It's still pretty flat um, on the top. You, I mean, this is a perfectly legitimate cushion. You could, you know, you see something like this on, um, on small bar stools and things like that that you might uh, have a flat cushion on. If I want to create a little bit more of a pillow to this, I can come back to my reference level and create another sweep, sketch a path. I can still paste that other one in because I haven't copied anything else. Paste it right where I want it. I'll pull that back to where I want to work on it. Edit profile, back again. And then I'm going to sketch from here. I'm going to create a little bit more pillow, pillowy top. Now, what I've done here is I've created a condition where up here in the corner, I don't really know when that is perfectly flat. But if I wanted to come from perfectly flat, what I can do is draw a sketch line here and use this tangent arc and create kind of a, a tangent line straight, straight off of that. And then I'll just sketch this down. And over to that point. Now, if I hit my check mark, check mark again, now I get a little bit more pillow off of that seam line. It kind of lumps up a little bit. Um, and then I can fill this other section, this void in here, with an extrusion. And I'll just go around and put that in. I'll hit my check mark, and I'm going to pull this up until it snaps to that point. I'm also going to pull the bottom up so that it's not all the way at the bottom. So now I've created a little bit better, of, a little bit better of a cushion. It's still pretty flat on the top, um, but you know it's better than that single kind of flat shape that we started with. So. In terms of getting really lumpy and that sort of stuff, that can be difficult. Um, but what you can do is make it kind of blocky. Um, so you could create shapes that have edges to them, and then after it's rendered, it's still going to look blocky, but you can smooth that out in Photoshop with a blur. So you blur the lines, and then the shadows weave together, and it creates a more, um, more seamless look. And then you create that kind of slightly lumpy effect. Um, that you're that you're looking for in a pillow. For me, this works just fine. Um, doesn't doesn't have a whole lot of detail to it, but it has just enough to pass as um, as a decent cushion um, for my my chair that I'm creating. So 
in terms of making this parametric, so I want to be able to adjust this on the fly and make this whatever size I want. So I'm going to go back to my original building block that I created, hit Edit Extrusion, and if I go to my reference level here, I'm going to put a dimension on this. So if I hit DI for dimension, and I come over here, I can hit, see how it says sketch line reference? That's what I want. I want to select my sketch line, and I'm going to come over to my other sketch line, and put a dimension there, and I'm going to put a dimension across this other way as well, because I want to be able to control both this direction and this direction, what this, how big this cushion is. So if I select this uh, dimension up here under label, right now it has none, which basically means it doesn't have a parameter or a constraint set to it. So I'll hit add parameter, and I'm going to type this, I'm going to name it the width. And there are two basic types of parameters here. Um, if I have a type parameter, if I change this uh, this width, every cushion within uh, within my project or my family is going to change with it. If I hit instance, it's only going to change this one cushion that I have selected. I personally prefer instance because I like the flexibility of having the option of changing just this single one. Um, if I want to without duplicating things over and over again. Um, that way if I want to I can come in if I want them all the same I can just right click on a cushion select under the right click menu hit select all an entire project I'll have every cushion in the entire project selected and then I can change stuff that way and everything's the exact same or if I want I can select an individual cushion and adjust just that one um, so depending on what it is, um, type might be a better option, instance might be a better option, depending on what you want to do with it. So I'm going to go with instance in this case and hit OK. So now it applies this label to it that says, OK, width is the, param is the name of the parameter that's going to be associated with that dimension. And if I add a parameter here, now I've got the option of selecting width here, um, but I don't want to be, when I change width, I don't also want this one to change. I want a different one for that. So I'm going to hit depth. And hit make that an instance as well. And hit OK. So now if I hit my check mark, those will go away because they're in the sketch mode. But if I go to my 3D view here, and I come up here under this family types with the little blue boxes on it, it'll open up this menu and it'll show me all of the parameters that I've created here. So, and I can test them out sort of on the fly here. So let's say I want to make this four foot and let's make this four foot as well. And I hit apply. So it uh, changes that shape. Now you can see that nothing else moved with it. And the reason for that is you kind of have to think how the computer is thinking in terms of we told the computer this shape is changing. We did not tell the computer that these are staying with it. So what we want to do now is change it so that all of these other shapes that we've created are moving with this shape. So if I come into my void form here, so I'm going to hover over here. So this is my void sweep. If I hit edit sweep and go into my sketch path, if I go to my reference level, now I'm going to throw dimensions on my sketch path from the sketch path line to the shape that I want it to stay, stay on. And I'm going to do the same down here. So I'll sketch that. I'm also going to sketch this line as well. Okay, so these are at 0 foot 0, which is where I want it to be. I want these to actually be out here, right? I want it to move with it, and when I change that, I want it to be there. So if I move those out there, these become zero as well. If I click on these dimensions, I can hit this little lock and lock it into place, so that way I'm telling it that I always want that dimension between this sketch line and the edge of that original shape that I drew in to be zero foot zero. So if I hit my check mark there and finish that sweep mode, it moves all that stuff out there.
Now, I'll have to do the same thing for the bottom one, but I'm not going to worry about that bottom one for now. I'm going to worry about my sweep here with my seam line and hit sketch path again. Go to reference. And I'm going to constrain all of these. And I'm essentially going to do the exact same thing that I just did with the other one. I'm going to move these up into place where I want it. And I'm going to lock these into place. Now hit the check mark and finish that. And then if I do my other, my, my sort of pillowed up sweep, do the exact same thing here. And I'm going to move these back up just like it was the other ones. Now I'm going to lock these in place as well. And I'm not going to worry about that last extrusion. You'll get the point. So, now that I've created all of these, this one's going to stay. It's not going to move because I haven't constrained uh, that one and told it I want it to be 0 foot 0 <coughs> in relation to everything else. So now if I come back up here and I go to test this again, Let's say I make this back at 3 foot, and I want this one back at, I think, 2 foot 9 was the original. And I'll hit OK. Now when it jumps all of that back, everything moved with it that I just constrained. So my void is now staying at the edge. My little seam line staying at the edge. So is my little kind of pillow top. Um, all of that stays constrained. This one obviously didn't, and neither did this one because I didn't constrain those two. So... That's essentially how you create a little parametric um, option there uh, for dimensions. Now, I'm g I also want the ability to change the material of my cushion. I don't want it to always be this gray color. Um, I want to be able to add like a fabric or something like that to it. So I'm going to select my cushion thing there. And over here, I can either apply a material here, which I might want to use this cushion in a variety of projects come in the future and I don't always want the same fabric so if I apply a, a fabric here it's I'm kinda stuck with that fabric unless I come into the actual family editor every time and change the material but that can get annoying so I'm gonna hit this little button on the side and it'll pull up this menu here and right now there's it says none because I haven't added any material parameters so I'm gonna hit add parameter I'm gonna name this cushion and then I'll hit an instance property for this as well and hit OK. Now nothing changes appearance wise but now this is grayed out. But let's say I come in and I want to make my little um, my little seam lines, I want my my rounded pillow top edge and I also want my my top to always be the same material as my basic shape here. Now if I come in and I hit my parameter now I have this this option that I've created before. I want it to be the exact same, so I'll hit OK. If I didn't want it to be the same, I just hit Add Parameter again and name it something new. But now, if I hit Load into Project, since I have that one project open, that's there, but I also have this Family 1, and that's what I'm working in. So I want to hit Family 1 and hit OK. Now, I bring this in and I have this cushion that I can place just like a piece of furniture within a typical project. So I'll click that in, and it looks weird because the items that aren't constrained are still kind of off to the side and weird. But I can go to, say, my front view here, and I can move this up and into place, um, and then I can start adjusting this. So if I click on this now, I've got these options here. I can apply a material now because I applied that uh, that parameter here. I don't have to go back into the family to, to modify it. I've got my depth and my width so I can start to adjust this back to say two feet and maybe the depth I only want to be say one foot six. And so if I had constrained these all of this would jump back obviously but now I'm getting 
getting the ability to kind of adjust that cushion size on the fly. So then if my if I did parameters within my chair, I can adjust my actual cushion based on the chair. Um, so in terms of doing parametric stuff, they can be really nice and really handy to build that stuff into your families. That way, if in the future you want to uh, want to adjust sizes, you can. So that's pretty much a brief kind of introduction to softening edges of families, making it look a little bit more realistic. Um, I know I didn't do the entire chair. That would take a little bit of time, but it's essentially the same principle as I was showing you here all over the entire chair. Um, so just using you know, your basic tools here, these solids, and then these voids, you can create almost whatever look you're, you're really going for. Um, and then you can bring in nested families such as this, and create this um, this whole effect um, where you're building families into other families that also have parameters associated with them. So, if you have any questions, obviously you can um, you you can shoot me an email or anything like that um, from class. Otherwise, uh, just ask me in class, and hopefully I'll have the answers for you.